The Park for May for podcast number 736. Woo! This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. That's right, a.k.a. Negative Camber. He's from Missouri, where they're all known to be killers of innocent men, women, and children. Which is why I need you to do me a favor. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's what I need you to do. Tonight, for your kind consideration, we're going to cover Formula One news. That's typically what we do on off weekends. Before doing that, though, I do have to introduce my co-host, which means... That's right. I got to go all the way to the right coast of our nation, nestled in the capital of our nation, where she has the Burj Khalif of cat trees. And she crunches numbers and does all kinds of statistical stuff that I don't understand, but I'm glad she does. You know her. You love her. It's the Redoubtable. Grace, Grace how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm pretty sure there's some shenanigans happening already. Yeah. There's only one cat in the cat tree and another cat has shown up. This oh, never, yeah. never works out good. Yeah, it's it's going down right now. So watch this space right here. <laughs> Kitty wars. This time it's personal. Yeah, that's right. So yes. um, pretty good. I like that you said that on the off weeks we cover F1 news. I don't know. Do we? Uh, uh, I, mean, I think people might debate that kind of. I think it accidentally happens sometimes, but I don't know. That, know once in a while. Yeah, that's a good point. You know. I mean, judging by the reviews, you know, yeah. Maybe occasionally we'll cover Formula One, and you would think that the rest of the hour we'd spend talking about nonsense. You know, I'm going to start out with some not F1 news, but some F1 related uh, information. So I did get some slack for my comments about Baku, which as soon as I said it, I was like, I don't know. Baku's actually, you're right, pretty good race usually. And I don't know why I still hold it against Baku. Some people were like, come on, Grace. I'm like, well, you know, you just say things and we don't edit and that happens. Yeah, it's all live. And then we get the race that we got. Like, you know, that makes up for Monica where I was like, well, gee, I don't know what Paul and Todd are going to talk about. I don't know how you kept it within the time frame that you aim for. I know. There's a few things going on there. So I just want to put it out now. You know what? Paul Ricard is terrible. It's boring and I always hate it. And I don't know why we still go there. (laughs) Here it comes. Feel the haterade. Let's hope. I mean, that track is that. Okay. So that one, if some do not tweet, hate me about how great power card is. Cause that is a lie. That yeah. is not true. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough track to watch. If you know, if you're mesmerized or even medically impaired by visual cues, like multiple stripes and fast moving object over multiple stripes, it's like that spinning disc, you know, (laughs) keep your look at the center and just stare at the center for 10 seconds and then quickly look at the wall spinning and you'll see Alonzo go around. Well, I was joking. So, you know, um, Flip plays the, you know, the Formula One game, right? And has a, a sim and a steering wheel and the whole nine yards, right? And so he's racing and somebody hits him and he spins out. And I'm like, well, at least you didn't hit anything, right? Because you're a Paul Ricard. It's like three <laughs> states away before you hit something, right? right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Right. You'll skid, you'll skid off. And by the time you hit the Tech Pro Barrio, that's like two languages away. Exactly. That's what yeah. I'm saying. And so I'm like, yeah. well, at least you didn't hit anything. That seemed like the only <laughs> right. input I had as, um, right. you know, often. Often, I'm not the kindest person when watching him race. Yeah, um, well, you know, that's all right. You know, anything. It's uh, you know, you're 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 entitled to your opinion opinion on Paul Ricard. I guess, I guess. I mean, I already give him a hard time because sometimes he'll will watch when they do the one driver laps, you know, mm-hmm. for the during qualifying, and he'll go, "Oh, so that's how he takes that turn." I'll be like, "Oh, George Russell, look at you! Like you drive the track." <laughs> I give him a hard time for that at all. Although it is very helpful because I have learned the tracks better by watching him race and having that input. But I do ah. always give him a hard time when he's like, oh, 
So that's how Charles Leclerc does it. I'll have to try that the next time I play. Uh -huh. Now jump in a car and go 180 miles and try right. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, different. I, can't, I can't do any of it. So that's why. No, I'm but off. the seat shakes. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I've been 185 miles an hour with yeah. Sebastian. And that, yeah, that was. That shakes. That was, yeah, that was white knuckle time. Also, I will put out there as you have cats, so you also understand that the second you're still, they often see this as, oh, this is my chance to like sit on you now because you yeah, are the yeah. warmest thing in the room. You're my yeah. my heat rock, like a lizard would right. be. So often, I picture him driving like this, and Mikasa just like sits right on his chest, and he's like looking around her trying to drive <laughs> <laughs> because that's love. You just leave her be, yeah, and you well. still try to play your game, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Well, that's crazy. All right. Oh, boy. Well, we did have an exciting race at Baku, sure and did. Paul and I did cover that. And uh, if you missed that race review, good news for you. You can still go download it. It's on our podcast on your preferred podcast listening app. Um, right. Also, uh, just a quick note. I keep saying this now, but, you know, every once in a while people miss it that we uh, now record the video of these podcasts and we throw them on YouTube now. You know, for the first, I would say, 400 and some podcasts, things were relatively, you know, it was, yeah, just a fun community and we all enjoyed each other. But as time has gone on, you know, people are, are, are pretty pointed. And I would say in the last year, maybe everybody's got that covid in you know covid influence haterade going on and frustration and so i do get a lot of feedback on that and some folks were not happy with me putting ads in our youtube video oh so apologies but we're not monetized and we're only doing 736 episodes of the podcast thanks to the graciousness of our Patreon supporters. Right. And I reckoned if I just threw the videos up and, you know, I had a few ads you could skip through or whatever, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But whew, apparently it was. So I did try to tamp that down. I apologize. You know, what do I know? I'm not a YouTube guru and I'm not a YouTube creator uh, per oh. se. Oh. We were creating content before creating content was a thing. Yes. So people need to back it up. Yeah, yeah, we were. We were since 2005. That's right. Yes. So, um, yeah, so apologies, but, you know, I may leave a few ads in there and, you know, just skip through them, man. You know, what do I get? Five bucks, you know? I mean, month? I watch Top Chef on Bravo's app and I have to watch eight apps every 20 oh minutes, gosh. right? Yeah. Come on, you you can and and much like during, especially when racing used to still be on speed, but it's the same six ads over and over again, I know. right? Like that's the worst <laughs> part. Like I wonder what's going to happen. I don't know because I've watched the same ad seventeen times in the last ten minutes. Yeah, it's so. usually Grammarly, and it's like, would you shut up? You know, it's like <laughs> writing is hard. No, no, not really. <laughs> you know, it's just okay. Yeah, writing is hard, and yeah. it's like I I don't want somebody recording every single thing I type. Don't go away. Stop. I do like how in the Formula One races here in the United States we get that mother's car wax ad. Yeah, because ESPN does not play. Like the second it's like over, it's over. Like oh, there's yeah. no like and we're, like there's no nice Bob Varsha going like and that's the end of our broadcast, right? Like no, it's just like <laughs> boom, done, and it's yeah, just like there's some woman. Wax, and that's it for the mother's. Family. Thank you for joining us and blah 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 for the something something Grand Prix. Be sure to ch tune in right. to whatever and. It, those are all like pre-recorded. Yeah. You know? It's just like the most abrupt thing. Like you it could is. be in the middle of a, you know, they could be interviewing something and they're in the middle of the sentence, but we hit our two hours and we're out. It yeah. doesn't matter. I know. We're all excited. They're spraying champagne and we're yep. waiting for Simon or somebody just, yeah. you know, to talk us down off the mountain a little bit, you know, nope. just ease us back yeah. into normal daily life. That's and right. then no, it just abruptly stops. And this woman who's still wearing winter clothes when they <laughs> recorded all those is saying, that's it for our coverage of the Formula One Grand Prix, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's like, uh, uh all right. Okay. I guess we're, I guess we're going to YouTube now, I guess, right? Yeah. I guess we're done. So I close my browser, stand up and say, I I don't even know how to process all that, you know? know? Yeah, because I still have to wait to get Ted Kravitz. So, you know, I got to wait. Yeah, got to wait and find some sort of rogue version of Ted's notebook to listen to. That is to. true. Why is that? Why do I have to find oh. rogue versions of Ted Kravitz's notebook? Because oh, because we're not British and we don't have Sky Sports F1, and I get that. But, 
you know, Ted Kravitz is the best thing those guys have got on most weekends. I know. He's like a great Cornish pasty, which, by the way, he hates the smell of. <laughs> but he actually provides some informative knowledge. Oh, he's awesome. I love Ted. Yeah, I, so I, I think know. Ted's great. I yeah. hate that I have to wait and then hope to find some random YouTube somebody. I know. I'm just glad it. Ted doesn't always constantly every weekend talk about how he runs around the circuits. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, man. No, but I, I do know. like at Monaco where I thought he was going to get into like, you know, a fist fight with Christian Horner's like media person. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, I'm live. So maybe you should talk to me or not. <laughs> it's tomorrow. Yeah. Right. That's great. See, even Ted Kravitz has that experience with Christian Horner. Not well, just, I felt, you know, I felt it was personal, yeah. you know, when I wished him a happy birthday the day before his actual birthday. But now if if he's got like, you know, media impress people, yeah. thugs that beat yeah. Ted Kravitz up, you know, I don't feel so bad. No, exactly. I didn't get, you know, I didn't get taken out behind the garage and kicked with steel toed boots. No, right. You know. I mean, that's it's Ted crazy. Kravitz. He's a national treasure. Well, he's a national hero, that Ted that's, Kravitz. That's right. They should make him Sir Ted Kravitz. Yes. And they gave him a, this is to, I guess it's Formula One, so I'm fine with making these tangents. But I also like that he has the, like, uh, Terry Woken slash Gene Rayburn, like, extender mic now. Well, that is the greatest <laughs> addition, and he should always have that. The Gene Rayburn microphone. Do you remember how long yeah. that thing was? Yeah, right? I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, right, so he called it the Terry Woken, yeah. mag, you know, microphone because he's British. But right. just, you know, here in America, that's totally the Jane, the Gene Rayburn, Gene Rayburn. like, yeah. long, you know, microphone, right? right. So that was, and that Simon's was... walking around with that big stick, you know, he looks like Gandalf, you know, walking well, you know, through the paddock. He uses it like a walking stick. And I'm somewhere like there's some audio guy that's like, I'm going to kill him. Yeah. Like that, that is an expensive piece of equipment, I'm sure. And yeah. you're using it like a $10 walking stick you got at yeah. REI. I'm sure some, right. uh, I'm surprised that he showed up at another race with it. Cause I'm sure yeah. that some audio guy was like. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I don't know what it, what kind it is. Not, it's not an SM57 yeah. or anything. I'm sure it's a $600 mic or something. He's got but it still. on this long boom. And imagine the audio guys in the auto truck, every time you tap it, it's like. <laughs> Yeah. Like, Stop it. I just, it's not a toy. I'm just waiting for some guy to like run across and just grab it and walk away from it. Like, yeah, you don't right. get to have this anymore. <laughs> Grow up, Simon. It's not a walking stick. You're a professional. Rise above it. Yes. It. Use your legs like God gave you. That's right. Let's talk about some Formula One news, shall we? Let's do it. I'm ready. Kind of big news out of the Williams camp. Did I say Williams? <laughs> yes, I did. And now Simon Roberts is going. <laughs> That's exactly what he's doing. New boss, Yost Capito, took a few months, actually, to be specific, 100 days to oh. assess the Williams operation where Ex he... Expired, 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 yeah. expired. Yeah. Done. Thanks, Aunt Bonnie. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and he determined... That there were some, he was looking for any sort of friction points and possible changes. Right? In a Formula One team, friction points? What? So imagine, if you will, you are the person that works in some part of the Williams operation doing some sort sure. of <laughs> Stuff. generic job. <laughs> right. And the new guy comes in and says, I'm taking a hundred days to assess everybody's job in this entire operation, right? You're, right. Like, <laughs> Yost is coming. Look busy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, but Patrick Henn said that they have some issues. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty strong. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway, one of those changes <laughs> that he has now seemed to find is the team principal Simon Roberts, who they've just kicked to the curb. And this is the very Simon Roberts a couple races ago that they were interviewing over the weekend. You know how right. Sky does that with Christian yeah. or or um, insert random team boss. Well, Simon yeah. Roberts was one, and I thought he did a great job. And, uh, well, no, no more. No longer. Nope. He is out. <laughs> oh, Give us your jacket, big boy. That's right. You're going home. So I can run up seven steps at a time so I can hang up your jacket on a meter. Yes, yes. So he's gone. BBC, BBC had an interesting take on this. They said 
that was what was interesting is Capito found that there was a disconnect between the racing engineering team and the factory engineering team. And in order to solve that, they were promoting technical director Francois Xavier de Maison, or is he's affectionately known as FX. And now FX is going to oversee all of the engineering from the racing to the factory and combine that into one. Apparently, maybe some of that communication between the racing team, and what they were experiencing on race weekends and testing wasn't really translating to the engineering team, the factory or vice versa. Anyway, having one person to sort of, you know, coagulate all of that random data and right. uh, and avoid any sort of miscues uh, is the issue. And Yost will be now managing the team. Team. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect this is the first in many changes uh, that Williams uh, will eventually do as the new owners look for more performance gains out of the team that they bought. And Not being get, the last? Yes. Yeah, right, right. So I'm thinking uh, Doralton's thinking... What would it take for us not to be last? How can we beat Haas, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, Haas has made it clear that this is basically a bus tour around the circuits this year for two rookies, and we aren't beating them. They're right. not developing their car at yep. all, and one of them is constantly wrecking. How can we not be beating Haas? If I'm Doralton, right. that's what I'm saying, right? Yes. They're beating themselves, and yet we can't beat them. Right. Yes. Right. right. They're DNF, and, and we're barely beating them when they DNF. That right? is correct. Right. So I have to think that more changes are going to come. Yeah. Now, with change, usually comes some level of investment from Doralton, I would imagine. Uh, but this move in and of itself just seems from the outside looking in mm -hmm. to be a pure cost cutting. I mean, you're right. basically eliminating that salary and absorbing that those duties back into two other people that are on payroll. Now, taking the first 100 days to make this change is interesting. And I'm even more curious if Yost feels he has the right components in place or if they're going to be actually hiring people to cure some of the technical issues that Williams is having from a chassis standpoint. Now, go ahead. No, I was just going to say they should just hire the Mercedes guys that Red Bull just hired. Right, right, right. Well, they could just poach them. Uh, they could poach uh, other key people from other teams. Now, you recall that they did make a philosophical change. They it, Williams used to just buy the engines, but then they right. made their own gearboxes, et cetera, et cetera. And now that Doralton owns them, they made a philosophical change where they're buying the engines and the gearboxes and all right. the components that is allowable from Mercedes, yeah. but they're still not performing at the level as other Mercedes customers are. So, you know, that's kind of challenging. It, it goes to show the performance delta between mm -hmm. McLaren, Aston Martin, and Williams is really significant. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done from Williams' part to try to be on par. Because if they're buying all the same componentry that Aston Martin is, they're not even in the same zip code as Aston Martin right now. Sure, right. Yeah. Um and I don't know that one move, you know, kicking some one dude to the curb is going to do it. No, I mean, in the race said the same thing, right? That the idea was that the kids at the factory and the kids at the race team, you know, that when it's when they win or they do well, they win. When they do well, <laughs> it's up to the uh, was that an ad? Am I going to have to end this now? Yeah. Quick trip ought to be sending me money. So should Red like, Bull, damn it. But they never that's, do. That's true. Um but they, um, the race, you know, yes, conflict, the kids right? at and they the said factory, the same thing, right? Yeah. Because the factory gets the kids at the factory get all the blame when stuff doesn't go right. well, and yet when things do go well, then the race team takes all the claims. So there's conflict between the two, um, and you know, this is sort of an us and like them together, right? It sort of reminds you of the the circle building versus the square building <laughs> issues at McLaren Those are the back in the day. The thought leaders are, right? The thought leaders, yes. And the square building. Yes. Yes. So I'm sure this is a, a problem that's common. I mean it makes sense to me, right? Like yeah. I mean sure. in my in my 
in my job, right? There's always conflict because you have the people at headquarters and then you're the people out in the field that are collecting your data. And funny, those two groups of people don't always see eye to eye, yeah, right? Yeah, because right. the headquarters people are saying, you don't see the data I see, you need to change this. And people in the field are like, I'm the one knocking on the door. What do you know? Right. So I think right. that kind of conflict is easy to see in, uh, I would imagine most professions. So I, it makes sense that the factory kids and the race team kids don't really kind of gel. And well, and it, and it lends itself a little bit to, you know, the bigger the company, uh, the more those sort of silos naturally just occur. Because, you know, if you're from product management or R&D to project, product management, uh, you have a certain passion for what it is you're designing. You have a segment marketing group or a regional or, or corporate marketing group that's trying to get their heads around the, the messaging. You've got the sales forces that have to get behind the product to go sell it. And then when you got you got to execute when you sell it, and then you have the order entry groups and you have all these different processes and different people that have varying different levels of passion for whatever it is they're doing. I mean, right. it's one thing to be a product manager who loves their product and worked with R&D to make it and got marketing to say the right things about it. But by the time you're down to ordering, you know, the order entry people and, the, you know, they're mm -hmm. that that's not the only product that they're ordering. Right. right. And their, their daily job is ordering all kinds of stuff. So you have varying levels of interest, varying levels of passion about uh, what happens. And it does shine a light on the fact that if you look at a, a group like Mercedes, as large as they are, that's even more opportunity for miscues, miscommunication, misunderstandings, different varying levels of, of passion for certain elements, you know, and it's amazing to get an operation that large to operate at that level of efficiency. Yes, because even a small team isn't small, right? right. Like in that sense, right? right? It's still a, a lots of people. Right. Um, yeah, I was trying to, th I watched a bit that Sam Collins did. Uh, he's with Sky, I think, right? And with Craig Scarborough, um, who I realized relatively recently, even though I know who Craig Scarborough is and I've seen his drawings and whatnot, I didn't know what he looked or sounded like. So it was mm. just another one of those like, oh, I would have never have known that that's who you were. <laughs> <laughs> but I know who you are. So and anyway, I was trying to think of what they call the, the um, because it's the parts that are touched by airflow are the ones that you have to design. And I think they called them, it was like wet parts or something like that, but it was super British and it's what the, they're calling the Formula One rules. And it was just like, oh, that's such a British way of thinking of like, you know, what was it like we, we dampen oscillation as opposed to absorbing shock, which was always right. the Steve Matchett, you know, versus, you know, English, English, English versus right. American English, but they had to, it was just such a, like a great way that the rules are written because it's this like great, um, visual, I think it's something like what parts I just remember that it w had nothing to do with airflow because Sam had to explain that. Um, I'm also going to take this tangent as well, because, uh, you mentioned how the, um, they just had the crew, the crew chief, gosh, the team principal hmm. at Williams before he got fired was, you know, the, the, yeah. the feature guy right on the wall that right. they were talking to. They also talked to Andrea Seidel, but with the mask on, that guy doesn't emote. He could have been right. saying anything, right? Like they could have, like his eyes don't move nothing. He just, the whole time was like this. And he could have been really excited, but he still just talked like this. And he could have been really sad and still just talked like this. Like <laughs> they could have like played any audio over his face because you can't <laughs> read his lips because of the mask, because there's no emoting going on anywhere yeah. else. It was great. I'm going to take over the entire EU <laughs> and I'm going to bend it to my will. And there's like nothing. Nothing. It was great. Yeah. I was like, he could be saying anything right now and they could just be piping in whatever they want. And we yeah. never know because <laughs> I don't just never, nothing changed. Yeah. There's no emoting going on there. But uh, yeah, well, so that's what I heard too, that it's an attempt yeah. to unify the team. And I mean, at this the point, title. yes, you know, if FX, I like that. I didn't realize that was his nickname. But if FX can, you know, do it, I think that we all have wanted oh, for the yeah. last 20 years Williams to not be terrible. So, oh, yeah. If FX, you can make Williams, he comes rolling cool. in this Monday morning. What you know about rolling down? Yep. Yeah. It's FX, and, man. Yeah. And, and the late night version is like what FXX? Wasn't that FX is like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After Dark Channel? It was yeah. a Ferrari car. 
Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ferrari, Grace. Yes. Big moves at the team boss role over there. Ferrari have gone and hired them a propeller head. Mm. Now, this is completely out of left field. Ferrari has hired Benedetto Vigna. I'm going to say, I'm going to, as an American, as a Yankee, we butcher names. That's That's just what we do for a living. But it's V-I-G-N-A. I I don't speak the language, but I'm going to say it's Vigna. Okay. All right. I don't know that. It could be Vigna. That's how we would look at it and say it. We're so, we're so literal. So yeah. anyway, uh, you'll recall the CEO, uh, Louis Camilleri, uh, retired suddenly last December due to personal reasons. And so Vigna comes from the technology industry, previously leading a division at ST Microelectronics, a very large electronics company, where he specialized in sensor technology. Mm-hmm. Now... While many in the business press look at this as an unusual appointment, as Ferrari's effort to reinvent itself as a real player in the EV market, that's how, um, where did I read that? Bloomberg? Financial Times? Wall Street? I can't remember. Anyway, it was like, oh, so they got a you know a guy from the electronics industry to try to get him in the EV market. I uh, oh, maybe I don't know, but I am curious how Vigna will approach the brand, the legacy, and the commitment to racing in general. Don't really care what he's doing about electric vehicles. Not interested. I am interested in what kind of money he's going to pour into the Formula One racing program and sports cars. I am interested in how he feels about the brand, which is one of the most iconic brands in the world, and the legacy that is Ferrari. Because when you hire from outside like that, you know, sometimes they come in and, and uh, you know, hopefully he'll really embrace that Ferrari Uh, ethos, if you will. Uh, Ferrari chairman John Elkin said that Vigna brings a, quote, deep understanding of the technologies driving much of the change in our industry and his proven innovation, business building and leadership skills will further strengthen Ferrari and its unique story of passion and performance in the exciting era ahead, end quote. What do you think about that, Grace? So, you know, we often talk about, uh, in response to Spygate, Flavio Briatore said, I don't know why McLaren just didn't steal other teams' engineers like the right. rest of you. So you may remember there was a bit of a controversy around 2019 that Ferrari was, you know, may or may not have been involved in, that may or may not have involved some sensors. And I don't know. Why don't we hire the sensor guy to help us out? <laughs> Why not? Why there not? was a fuel f- detection, a fuel flow uh, sensor thing. What is a sensor, though? It I'm is a just, sensor. I'm just saying. Uh huh. How do we get around this? Let's hire the guy that knows a lot about sensors and let's see if we can work our magic. I see Benedetto down there with a soldering iron <laughs> beavering away. No, no, man. We used to make these sensors. You wouldn't even know they're working. Yeah. So if we suddenly see Bonato without all the hair, we'll know what happens. (laughs) A soldering accident. (laughs) (laughs) It'd be like the Christmas tree and a Christmas vacation. Just yes. (laughs) All the flames just. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, Ferrari. Okay, so read into Elkin's statement, which you will, whether you feel like he's saying, hey, we went on, got a computer guy and a stuff for our EVs. Okay, whatever. That's not quite how I read that. But anyway, Ferrari, in my mind, has been in new territory ever since the key management shakeup a few years ago with the ouster of Luca de Montezemolo and several top key management positions, including Mm -hmm. several F1 uh, team bosses, Uh, including Arizio. Arriva Benny. It's always a big emotion. It's always a big emotion when you dump Arizio. I think that bullet point is very true. Yes. And 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 I think it's been reeling ever since that. In many ways, I think this internal turmoil is what actually impacted the future Sebastian Vettel had at that team. But that's just my opinion. I I mean, I I I agree with that. Yeah. Will Vigna turn things around or Vigna or how you pronounce the name, whatever. Time will tell. Some soldering skills. Well, he's got mad soldering skills. (laughs) Give me the solder sucker. Um. And time will tell. But 
If you're Charles Leclerc, 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 however you pronounce the name, whatever, and Chuck Carlos LeChair. Sainz, <laughs> Chuck the chair, uh, and Carlos Sainz, you are hoping that Benedetto is a huge racing fan. Yeah, right? Like, yes. I don't care. I think especially if you're Carlos Sainz, like, you know, because that would be his luck. Like, I just got here. What's yeah. wrong? People, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, Carlos needs to go grab him by the ear, march him into the office in Marinello, yeah. point at the big uh, uh, artificial wax uh, 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 person sitting at the desk and point and go, This is Enzo Ferrari. Yes, that's, that's what right. he needs to do. That's right. So let's let's hope. Everybody. I hope so. I don't yes. know. I'm just saying those sensors they're gonna look a little better now. Oh, get those fuel sensors all of a sudden just just Ferrari's magically got that power back. I don't know why the EV thing. I'm I'm perplexed by that as well. That's I don't know. Um, you know, I guess yeah. Why not uh, go get a guy who's a computer propeller head guy and we'll see what we can make out of that. This, it's also not the same as EVs either, right? Like that's like, you know. Uh, you know, Flip does IT stuff, but he's not a website creator. Like that's a that's a yes, mm. it is under the IT umbrella, but that is not necessarily what he yeah, does. Yeah, and right? I don't I don't know enough about ST microelectronics to know what all divisions they have and how many of those may be heavily invested in EV technology that's used in the EV and may there there very well could be. Um, but I think he was running a division that was kind of focused on sensors and or at least that's I think yeah. I read that in the Wall Street Journal or or um Wherever I saw that article at, uh, apologies. Uh, I linked to the article on the story on our website. I just can't recall it. Financial Times is going to be very mad now because you know they listen to this podcast. Yeah, I don't think it was FT, but uh, but it was somebody. Uh, oh, CNBC, I think, is where I saw it. All right. Yeah, well, all right. I'm sure they so don't they listen go. to the podcast either. No, We're in the clear. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt they do. Uh, hey, right. you'd be forgiven, folks. For completely forgetting about our dear friend, Eric Bouye. Never forget. Never forget Eric Bouye. That's right. Because he's not gone, folks, from F1. No, no. Quite the contrary. He, unless for those of you that haven't been keeping track of this meteoric career of his, he is now the boss of the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard. And he said... That the Turkish Grand Prix cancellation was a big problem for him. Now Let we me elaborate. Move our very boring race to a whole different weekend. <laughs> oh, we. So <laughs> let me elaborate. Following the cancellation of the Turkish Grand Prix, right. F1 asked Bouye to move the Paul Ricard event from its original date, which was June 27th, to June 20th. That means he had to move it a week ahead in order to make way for a second race in Austria. Right. Now, he said, quote, it was a big problem. You don't set a Grand Prix up in the last three days. It's a few months work, which we had to scrap and to adjust and to move. During the Grand Prix, I've got 1,200 people. They had booked their week to work for us. And when you move that date six weeks before, they have to change all those plans. Then the speculation, uh, the spectators, sorry. Then the spectators, obviously, everybody is booked plane, train, accommodations, or whatever, and they had to change everything again. So it's been a real challenge. We moved the date earlier by one week on F1's request, and we lost 20% of the spectators, but the tickets have been resold straight away, so that's good. He said that the Grand Prix is going to host, Grand Prix, sorry, is going to host 15,000 spectators in separate sections with separate entrances, and it will be the biggest event in France post-COVID. So... Uh, who knows? But he did also add this. He said with more possible cancellations, he said that they would be willing to host another race later in the season. I loved it. You guys completely screwed me over. I can't believe this. I hate all of you. But if you want us to host another one, we'll be more than happy to do it. May I have some more, please? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Morale will improve, right? I think that yes. the beings will stop when the morale improves. So I think right. that that was, that was my favorite hook of that story was that yeah. like, oh, my God, all this work, all these things you make us do. But if you want to have another one, we'll be ready for that. I mean, we'll do it again in a heartbeat. No problem. <laughs> Just let us know. We're here. Not a um, problem. 
yeah, I get that. And I feel like those those people have been saved. Those people that were planning to come to Power Card and are now off by a week and are still going to come to France, but yeah, not right. go to the race. Enjoy that time you got back in your life. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So I think well, speaking, that, that speaking good. of tracks, we have news from Coda. Huh? What news from Gondor? Well, uh, the news from Coda is something similar with the cancellation of the Singapore Grand Prix. Coda boss Bobby Epstein says that they are happy to host two races this year. That makes sense to me as the circuit lost its race last right. year due to COVID. And that meant that they lost around 95% of the track's revenue. So mm -hmm. doubling down this year would be, would, you know, be very helpful. Right. right. He said, quote, as long as I put the word possible in front of it, then we're good. He said a second race in. <laughs> Don't give away your secrets, man. <laughs> <laughs> we could possibly, possibly pull this off. Right. Yes. He said a second race in Austin is possible. I read that and thought, well, that's true, he said when they were talking about it. A second race in Austin is a done deal. That is not true. Um, he said, but it's easy to flip it if they decide they want to and they need to. And it's the best decision for the sport. They can make that decision and, we, and we're there for that. Um, so... He says they're open, totally happy to do it. Um, you know, if you and also if you think about finding another location means all the logistics and weather concerns in October and all those things that are compounded in North America. Right. And and Bobby says, you know, if it's good for F1, you don't have to do all that. You know, you can keep everything there because yeah. um, there was some talk, you know, and it's just a bunch of. The scuttlebutt. And, oh, well, we're going to go to Indy because, you know, they've got a track there and no, we can do that. No, don't, don't go, go to Indy. No, don't go to Indy. No. Go back this to Coda. This is horrible, this idea. Don't. Um, I, right? Yeah, like, yeah. why would you, why would you no, do that? No, don't. We and Bobby rather... was like, you know, it's in Indianapolis in October. You could get frost. You could get, you know, yeah, just stay and in And it's Austin. Indianapolis and there ain't shit to do. Let's go to Texas again. Yeah. Instead of going to St. Elmo's, you know, it's about it. That's right. It There's a, a lot. Good stick. Well, it is, but, you know. Yeah. It's, it's a good place, but I think that I, even just from the track perspective, I'd much rather go to Coda twice. But I also like yes. that you followed this after the Eric Boulay story that was like, oh my God, the National Tees, like, this is so hard. You made us move it up a week. What are we going to do? And then you have Bobby Epstein who's just like, yeah, whatever. Just whatever. Two days before, just let us know. We'll be yeah, there. Just let us know. We're there. Yeah. We'll open the gates. It's fine. Yeah. We'll whatever. dust the track off. It's good. Come on over. I think the reality is Bobby knows that if they desperately need to add a second race, they pay him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, so he's like, yeah, we'll do I'll that. I'll make it happen. Whatever. If yeah. I could offset my total F1 expenditure for hosting a race by paying for one and then getting reimbursed for that yeah. and hold two races, sign me up, man. Everything else is gravy. We're selling turkey we'll, legs and hot dogs. We'll figure it out. That's yeah, right. We're going to figure it out. That's right. We're so, going to merch the hell out of this thing, man. That's right. I just like the, like, tale of tale of two racetracks here we got going on. Yeah, here. right, right, right. You know. uh, let's see. Also in the news, Aston Martin. We were speaking about teams and logistics and all the challenges. Well, Aston Martin, their new HQ, their new headquarters is set to open in August of 2022. And our friend and yours, Otmar Snapnauer, says the team will begin hiring key people to bridge the gap to their rivals. Here's what he said. He said, quote, we've added significantly the amount of people we have since we were Force India. The new factory is on track. We have started building already. And it's a big, big program to recruit even further. We are at about 535 people now, and we will get to about the region of 800 or whatever the right size is under the cost cap. And we are strategically working on that now and trying to recruit like-minded individuals that want to come work for Aston Martin Racing and go racing at the highest level. The recruitment process is going well. Well, Otmar, I got to tell you, it's a little weird because nobody in HR has called me. <laughs> right. It didn't go on that well, my friend. That's right. Like-minded people. Yeah. But I think that... 
So are they staying at Silverstone or are they building somewhere else? No, they're there. Yeah, they're building oh. a, you know, a. It's bigger. A, they're just building a bigger square and a bigger circle, but they're staying in the same location. Yeah, it's like Lawrence Stroll's junk hut. You know, it's a big <laughs> HQ, you know, thing. Okay. There. I was just wondering, you know, I, I thought I thought I was going to have to memorize a new location for when I read stuff in Autosport, right? <laughs> practically based team like i don't want to have to remember remember a new location so <laughs> right right there especially you. the british locations you know right. they're always they're always tough to kind of you know remember you know yeah. i always remember woking right and there's brackley and right milton Keynes and mm -hmm. silverstone's easy right you know but if it's something over time something yeah, don't, don't by the me river something off you know i don't know it gets a little weird yeah so no more new locations they're just building a right. bigger facility in their current location All it could right. be lawrence by sea this is the new address <laughs> Even though there's there any sea near them probably not probably not all right. Not. But you know, did you know that Silverstone used to be a World War II airstrip? Oh, you know what? I'm sure they're going to remind us of that 700 sure times. Yeah. But sure I do want to give a, a shout out to all you Sebastian Vettel haters, because much like Russell Rusbrook, I think you all owe him an apology now because he doesn't suck and people yeah. need to bring it down a notch. So yeah, everybody needs to just tone it down a little bit on the on the sub hating. You yes, know? that's I right. Mean, you know, not every you know, not every race has gone his way no, this year, and but I think in know. Baku he's kind of shown that you know, eh, yeah, maybe Ferrari was the anomaly and not him. Right, maybe this. maybe that's it. So give you know, give him a much needed break. Can I go for a wee? Yes, sub, <laughs> you go for a wee. That's right. I also want to note that uh, unrelated was that Baku finally. They can stop running the ticker underneath every shot of Fernando Alonso that Ocon's beat him in every race because he finally beat Ocon in a race. So right. now you can all stop saying that too. Right, right. That's Gosh. true. Oh, hey, speaking of winter races, yeah. it was a good day and a bad day for the Swedes. That is correct. In Detroit. Did you see it? The good news is mm -hmm. our friend, everyone knows and loves him, Marcus Erickson. Yeah. The Swede won the Detroit Grand Prix for IndyCar this weekend, which does nothing but bolster my longtime phrase for him. Don't F with the Swede. That's right. All right. You don't F with the Swede. And he won. Now, it didn't go so well for Felix uh, uh, Rosenquist, fellow Swede. Mm -hmm. He had a stuck throttle and hit the barriers yeah. head on full throttle in a brutal incident. He was checked to the medical center, sent to the hospital, kept overnight on observation and released. So thankfully, he's OK. But uh, great result for uh, Marcus Erickson. Anyway. Kudos to you, Marcus. Great win. I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see him have some success at uh, in IndyCar. It's great. Yeah. Speaking That's of it. success, Grace. Well, the success just keeps on rolling. It just keeps on going. Did anyone watch the IMSA race in Detroit? Of course you did. Why? Because our very own Paul Charsley and the team that is Heart of Racing, Aston Martin, won that's right. They won. They actually finished the race in P2, <laughs> believe it or not. Right. And they were in second Detroit, uh, Detroit in the race this weekend. But they inherited first place as the winning team. Carbon with Paragon Racing was found to have, quote, demonstrated a refueling time faster than the minimum full fill refueling time in the class specific BOP table. So this is the longest sentence to just say, you took too long refueling. Or do you, no, it was too fast. Oh, you were too fast. You're right. Yes. Faster than the minimum. Like, yes. Why, why do you use like 17 words to just say you moved through the pits too fast? Yeah. You guys are injecting fuel in the cars much faster than what's allowed for your That's class. right. All yeah. right. Yeah. So I, just, I texted Paul and Paul and I had a, had a kind of a back and forth over text. I won't say anything yeah. about that. It wouldn't be appropriate, but it's a it is a bummer because the guy yeah. who won is Jeff Westfall. We love Jeff Westfall. Yes, Jeff is right. awesome. And uh, when I did the Audi driving experience that Paul was gracious enough to take me out, Jeff was one of the instructors, and I had a great time with Jeff. And we've interviewed Jeff, and we've had him on covering for Paul in the past on race reviews. Jeff's a super cool guy, great driver. Yeah. And he won in that Audi, and it's just a shame that the team either missed that or, or did that. It's just a shame uh, because he really deserved the win. He's a great guy. Yeah. However, on the 
other hand, Ian James, Paul, Roman DeAngelis, eh. Ross Gunn, the entire team at Heart of Racing. How cool is that? A P1. Very exciting for Ian and the entire team. Uh, what a great job. So if you guys aren't following uh, the IMSA series and, and the number 23 Aston Martin Harder Racing, you really should because Paul is the sporting manager for that team, working with his dear friend Ian James, who yeah. runs that team. And, and they're doing really well. I mean, they're in the top three, top four. To, you know, I mean, they're mm -hmm. gunning for wins and uh, it's a lot of fun to watch. So I just want to point out that. Look, you do racing notes. I'm I'm not mocking your racing notes, but I did have a giggle about the, your 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 typo here, which is instead of the the heart of racing team, the here to racing team, which I like. Like oh, we're here I to like race. That. We're the here to <laughs> race, to race team. team. I like it. Instead yeah. of you know heart of racing team, here to race team, the here to race team. So I like uh, it. I like it too. So that, that's a, a you know again. You're typing this stuff up. You're living your life. You're doing these things. But that one I like. Here to race team. I like it. That's good. That's why All we're right. here. We're here to race. We're here to race. It's, so it's is Paul. Name. He's here to race, man. That's he right. did send me a picture. They all went on after the race, and everybody had their beers lined up. Everybody yes. was having a celebratory drink. That's so. great. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it was good. All right. Should we talk yeah. about some Albans Cats section? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's time for a little Albans Cats. <laughs> Okay. All right. You know what? I feel like that music appropriately goes with a picture of Albon's cats. Yes. Yeah, so any of you watching our YouTube version you of this go. podcast will see Grace holding up uh, the cats. The first thing I wanted to mention <laughs> is Fernando Alonso was signing George Rus or singing George Russell's praises this week, saying he does something special every weekend. And uh, and I didn't realize I must have missed the story that they had the two of them swapped helmets during the Monaco Grand Prix. You know, this was a thing. Yeah, they didn't either. So they swapped helmets and apparently uh, Fernando signed his helmet and gave it to yeah. George. And on the helmet, he said, George, you rock. <laughs> And then he put future world champion. And so they're asking him, oh, future yeah. world champion. What? Whoa. Why were you writing that? And he waxed poetic about George. And I thought it was delightful. And if you ever needed a letter of recommendation for that second seat at Mercedes, I'm kind of thinking he could just go in, turn that helmet around yeah, and show right, Toto like and say, here's my letter of recommendation from a two-time world champion. Oh, that's right. That's right. There you go. It was yes. good. Who, who do you it. recommend? This guy. Right. Yeah, I didn't realize that was a thing. I wonder if that's always a thing. Because, like, um, NBA players at the end sw swap jerseys a lot of times, right? Right. And so I, right. I wasn't sure if this was, like, always a thing because i mean helmets are a bit more expensive than yeah. uh, a jersey but well fernando can afford it i mean sure he can and um speaking just, of things that are expensive grace yes. so code repress sent you this link oh yes they did this is great i'm gonna hold this picture up this charles the chair is charles leclerc look at that jacket and I swear what's he, he wearing like He's wearing, let me zoom in here, he's wearing Ferrari's brand new internal fashion line. I just love it that they have one. Oh, oh, oh. He looks like something out of Star Wars in that jacket. I just was like, That's oh right. my goodness. Looks like a bounty hunter from the cantina. Yeah, Ferrari can't have this. AlphaTauri, they, they can't have this. What is right? everybody coming out of their own fashion line? And then, I mean, it's time for Benetton to come back at this point. Yes, they missed it. Where have they, yeah. you know, right? They were ahead of the time. Yeah, you could get floppy. <laughs> you know, that would be good. I just So yeah. they have the new fashion line, I guess. Now, I, um, I took the liberties of inspecting this new fashion line. And Grace, I've got to tell you, it is on par with Lewis Hamilton's Tommy Hilfiger line. Yeah. I'm looking at it on CNN style. Oh. And uh, yeah, they rolled out their first in-house fashion collection offering fans of the Ferrari brand. That's us. And it's supercars. That's not me. Uh, I love them, but I don't own one. Uh, a touch of couture within a contemporary clothing range. The launch marks a major step in Ferrari's new brand strategy, one of its biggest investments outside the car business, which the company wants to account for around, are you ready for this? 
10% of the profits in seven to 10 years, folks. That means that the total revenue that the Ferrari company makes, they want 10% of that to come from their fashion brand. Do they have anything else besides the cars? Like, I mean, they make that sound like, you know, they have like toaster ovens or something that they're. Yeah, well, you know. Three kinds of heat. I just think that <laughs> all they have is cars <laughs> and a fashion line. <laughs> They should make their own sham wow. Yes. You know, I the know. Italians are always making good things. It's German. That's how you know it's good. I yeah, just right. think that uh, my response was, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that I have some ideas for how they should do their product launch. And it, yeah. was, a, it was a picture from the 1000th GP celebration from last year because nobody should ever forget about that. No. When no. I watched Drive Survive, I was very happy that the annals of history will always have mm. that moment right. captured in Drive to Survive because that, sir, was great. People climbing down walls, it was crazy. You thought Lewis Hamilton being flown into an opera was crazy. That whole thing was crazy. And all those people had to just sit there with all those other people and like pretend like this was fascinating and interesting instead of just like, what am I doing with my life? Right. So right. interpretive dance. It was something. I don't know. It was something. But uh yes. and it just kept going. And so uh, that's that's what I feel like they should do as well for their um, entertainment when they maybe, announce it. Maybe for the next podcast, I should have Paul work up an interpretive dance of his victory in Detroit. Ooh, that I'd like to see. I, I would also, love to see that. I also want to see if, because AlphaTauri always does the, like, all this fashion stuff with Gasly and Yuki, right? Maybe Ferrari will start doing the same thing of, like, them and, ah. like, their, like, street clothes, which isn't street clothes because it's AlphaTauri's clothes, right? Right. And so that's maybe, what really pisses Kvyat off the most. Because he didn't get to hang around to get all the cool fashion. That's right. And Max Verstappen stole his baby mama. So, you know. <laughs> right. Never ends. Oh, that um, that's gonna be an interesting holiday time. God, I want that wedding. I want to be in that wedding so much. Like, Imagine Kafiq going over to get the kid, and there's Max coming out. <laughs> no. and, you know, so great. But hey, I Max. think that yeah, I hope that I hope they do, or that they have you know, like Charles Leclerc in his like racing suit, but with that jacket, right? Like yes, that ninety big... degrees weather, right? And this yeah. big like long leather coat i don't know it it was crazy but thank you for sending it to me because it is absolutely lewis hamilton fashion worthy and I, deserves yeah. a place here in this segment see i i like it too i think that whole jacket and everything kind of looks i don't know i don't know I, I was trying to figure it out but you're right it's it's got a a specific look to it it's um yeah. i don't know i'm just looking at it again it just what did you, what did you say it looked like? Something out of Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, I get. Yeah, I it, see the that. The leather makes it kind of look futuristic-y, and it's really long, and you know, yeah. and then he has like the red fabric in the background, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you know, that. Makes okay. Kind of feels very like Star Warsy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. There you go. Yeah, and now their CEO used to work for a sensor company. Yeah, that's exactly right. So they're good. They're good now. You know what they should have done is put him in the new clothes. <laughs> yeah, hey, we've got a new CEO sporting our we, new fashion line. This is right? how we haze you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ferrari, dude. Yes. That's right. All right. All now right. you must climb the buildings. All yeah, right. So. so I have a few things that I'd like to also place All in right, Albon's cats. Um, first is, so there's a lot of discussion about the Lewis Hamilton break magic, right? Mm. At, at Baku. And I do, I do love how Bono goes, well, it was off when you left here. Like, we're not blaming you, but I'm just telling you that last time I looked at it, because I know, I mean, you have kids, but I'm sure, you know, there are times, soon you will be not kids in the house. And there was a time when you didn't have kids in the house, but I definitely do that. Like, Somebody left the refrigerator door open. Clearly it wasn't me because I right. would have closed it, right? So there's yeah. only two of us. So that means it was you. So it was very much <laughs> like that. The one was like, I don't know. When you left here, it was turned off. I don't know what happened. I don't know. But hey, get in there, Lewis. Get in there, Lewis. I, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying last time yeah. I touched it, the door was closed, right? So, um, but I, I, 
I think in all this discussion of what is break magic, why do they use it, how do you accidentally bump it, all these things, I really just think break magic should be the next flex seal product because they literally have like a line of like six things. Break magic just seems like I could just see Phil Swift with his break it's, magic. It's perfect. Hi, Phil Swift here for it's flex perfect. seal. I love it. See, so I think this is a new Flex Seal project product. You know, Flex Seal should come up with some products and get in the automotive world, and then they could do brake magic. That's right. I think yeah, you I know, like it. brake magic. Yeah, so I like uh, it. I'm all in Good. on that. Um, I'd also like to point out that so they did another one of the, uh, you know, uh, pit wall to Mike Massey. Hey, everybody, speed yeah. into the yellow flags. Aren't you going to do anything about it? Right. And I love that Mike Massey, I mean, whether or not you agree with what he said, I just love his dad logic. It was totally like, you're all going to your room. <laughs> I don't care who started it. I'm finishing it. You're all going to your rooms. Right. And I just love that kind of like dad justice. That he like, well, they're speeding. He goes, yeah, but they were all speeding. Right. <laughs> And so I love that. So Flip told the story of his dad, like when they were kids, because he has two older sisters. And it's like, so one of his sisters would get in trouble and he and his dad would turn to him and go like, I don't know why you're laughing. It's not like you're right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Like, I don't know why you think you're getting off with something here. You're all terrible people. And I can't believe you. I let you live in this house with me. Right. right so right. Yeah, I just that was love funny. Mike Massey's, you know, dad logic and like, you're all in trouble and I don't care. And you're all going to your room. Yeah. So Everybody's going to the room. That's right. I'm yeah. in, I'm finishing it here. Yeah. Uh, dad logic. And then one last thing, because you know, I realized that last podcast, I really like the whole like dentist in love with the stepsister thing was just like really set a high bar, I feel like, <laughs> for my Albon's cat news. And that I don't know that I can ever live up to that again, because that was some monumental information that I found out there for, you know, just random internet search. But did you know? that vegetables aren't real? No. So vegetables aren't a real thing. A vegetable is a culinary term, not a botanical term. So like ah. fruit are a real thing. It's a botanical term. Vegetables are just what culinary people call parts of plants that we eat. Ah, there are how no about vegetables. That? It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Really? It's a lie. Yes. Uh, lies. Oh, lies! That's crazy. But if I have to have my mind blown about the fact that I've been eating plant organs and I thought they were vegetables, and they're not. It's just parts of plants that you just eat. parts of plants. Okay, fair enough. You know, it's vegetables. It's all, all a right. lie. We'll back it down on the kale then. Well, you know, I don't know. I like kale. I, don't I know. Don't. Everybody, everybody hates on the kale, I know. but I know. Everybody was talking on Twitter about uh, Roman Grosjean, right? Or Roman Grosjean. Roman said, <laughs> he's not, not a lettuce. It's not romaine. I just wish, <laughs> you know, like, I, I loved it when Dan Weldon wore the shirt that said, like, remember me? I won the Indy 500. Yeah. Like, I love that kind of, like, low-key, not low-key, you know, anger, bitter sarcasm in a T-shirt. So I really just want, you know, Grosjean to wear a shirt that says, right, I'm not French. I'm not, I'm French. I'm not lettuce, right? Like, I yeah. just, and he never will because he's actually a nice guy and a professional, unlike me. Right. Well, this is how I'm, professional Roma, because, see, I said, at least he's a good piece of lettuce i'm like iceberg yeah. lettuce i'm That's like the true, red right. salad right he's at least delicious he's romaine. lettuce right right so did you see what it, it, this the guy's got nerves of steel you know he was in that wicked crash last year yeah. burnt his hands okay in detroit pulled over his car starts to smoke and catch fire he jumps out of his car it's gonna burst into flames he sees it he jump like you know imagine yeah. if you will what was going through his it's mind happened, watching right? that car start to catch fire in Detroit and what he was thinking, right? This would be back, bring back horrible memories. Yeah. No, he jumps out of his car, runs over to the, to the marshals, grabs a fire extinguisher, runs back to start putting his own car out. I thought, dude, that's awesome. I'm out. Yeah. I, I ain't got that. It's amazing. Yeah, good for him, Roman. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So Roman Grosjean, I'm, I'm glad yeah. that, you know, if Formula One feels like they don't have space for him, I'm glad that somebody else has been. Yeah, me too. Account. Me too. Yeah. All right. Is that it? That's all I got. That's I mean, it for the podcast. Were, vegetables were lies, a pretty big, 
Yeah, Ender, that's a big one. Yeah, that's a big one. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, that does it for this show. Be sure to uh, share your opinion over at theparkforme.com. Share your opinion. Just do it at Corman Civility. Huge thank you to our Patreon supporters out there, because without you, we would not and could not do this podcast. So thank you very much. Big shout out to Ian, who I met uh, as a great guy and uh, found out that he and his wife now watch Formula One because of the Netflix series. So great yeah. to have him and his wife on board for formula one and getting into the series and great to have you on board and uh that's awesome also go over to itunes give us a little love give us a good rating over there if you like the podcast uh share it with some friends tell people about it and until next week when we come back to review a race this is todd aka negative camper saying so long grace in a couple weeks that's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. I don't feel I've got to prove at all. I, I don't think I, I don't really want to prove anything. I started as an amateur not, uh, with no idea or no intention of uh, becoming a world champion. It was I was curious to find out um, what it was like to drive a car fast, to drive on a certain circuit, to drive a certain type of car.